Now it is um, my sincere pleasure. I mean, Byron actually alluded to uh, mortgages and fixed, alternative fixed income vehicles, so it's not my pleasure to introduce another all-star in the realm of mortgages and, and fixed income, Mr. Philip Barash. Philip Barash is the uh, co-founder and president of Double Line Capital. And for those of you who don't know, Double Line has been uh, one of the greatest beneficiaries of Bill Gross's departure from Pimpico. And Phil and his partner, Jeff Gunlach, are, are heralded as the next bond kings that, uh, that we know of in the US. Phil has over 32 years of fixed income investment experience, which includes co-founding TCW Mortgage Group, serving as a senior vice president of chief investments for Sun Life Insurance Company, where he managed a $5 billion portfolio, and a, as a principal fixed income officer for CalPERS, the largest uh, pension plan in the US. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Philip Barash. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank Prime Quadrant for setting up this conference in support of Bakerest Foundation, doing their part for Tikkun Olam, especially Mo Litsky and Yifat Sharon for inviting me and telling me about it. I think it's a great honor. It's actually a great thing for people to get together in support of an organization. A little bit about the Double Line. Double Line is a fixed income money manager. We're headquartered in Los Angeles. It says over here we have 55 billion. Now we're up to about 60 billion dollars. It's an employee-owned firm, and we concentrate, I think, on doing things a little bit differently. That's why we focused a lot on mortgage-backed securities. It turns out we actually do a couple funds in Canada. We have one closed-end fund that trades on the Canadian Stock Exchange called BMO, which is a sort of closed-end bond fund. And we also have a fund that's marketed through Nordea, the Total Return Mortgage Fund, which is a clone of our US fund, which has about uh, 40 billion in it. The Nordea fund has about uh, 1.4 billion in it. Now, I've taken some public speaking courses, and they've always say, well, before you give a course, you should you know, give a little talk, warm up the audience a little bit. So I'll tell you a little story. And it's a story is about this young physicist, a nuclear physicist. And he was pretty good at his job. And after a while, he started to get invited to conference after conference to speak at these conferences, something like this. And it became so good, they started paying him some money to do it. So after a while, he decided to hire a car and a driver so he could get to his meetings. And he would go from meeting to meeting and meeting, and he'd give his, uh, his speech, and the driver would you know, take care of all the things essential to driving, take care of the car, get him there, pick him up. And one day, the driver says to him, he said, Mr. Professor, I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's right. I mean, you go, you give the same speech over and over and over again. You get all the accolades, you get all the money, and I drive the car, I have to figure out everything, take care of the car, to figure out the routes, do everything like that, and I, I don't get any money, and I you know, don't get any accolades. So the professor said to him, well, if you think it's that easy, why don't we just switch jobs? So they said, okay, so they changed clothes, and then the professor drove the car to the meeting, and then the, uh, the driver who's dressed as a professor went up on the podium like this, and he started giving his speech on nuclear physics. And he heard it so many times, he did a really good job. So when he finished, he was about ready to walk down, and someone said, excuse me, professor, excuse me, I have a question. And that person starts ask, asking a very complicated, multifaceted, you know, six-part question. So you know, the driver's up there, and he thinks, he walks back and forth a little bit, thinks, says, you know, sir, I've been giving this lecture for five years. I probably talked to 2,000 people over those five years. And no one has ever, ever asked me a question as stupid as that question before. I'm. In fact, that question is so stupid, I'm going to have my driver, who's standing at the back, answer it for you. <laughs> so that's not to discourage questions, but I uh, thought it would be an interesting way to start a conference. Well, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the, the, the housing market. And you can see here's, here's a chart of the housing ETF in the United States. And why I talk about the housing market, housing market is very important. It represents nearly 20% of the GDP of the United States. It's very important to the Federal Reserve Bank. Housing is incredibly sensitive to interest rates. As Byron said, small changes in interest rates can have a huge impact on the housing market. And it's our belief at Double Line, and my belief, that uh, housing is too high. This ETF could probably be a good short if someone's interested in being aggressive on that. And in these charts here that I'm going to show you, and there's going to be a lot of charts, you don't have to pay attention to all of them, be the theme of why there's major demographic and economic changes that will cause a slowdown in the housing market, more so than, than, than people would, would have expected. 
You know, we, if, if you take a look, this chart over here shows new home sales over the last 10 years. And they're mostly down due to a lack of supply. You know, for a period of time after the housing market crisis, builders stopped building. They were afraid. And of course, banks wouldn't lend them any money. And if you can't, don't have money, you can't really get anything done. And it sort of continued on. You see there's been a slight improvement, but we're nowhere close to the 1.4, 1.5 million housing starts that we had before the crisis. And it's my prediction that we won't see 1.4 million housing starts in anyone's career over here in this room. It's going to be a long, long, long time before that happens again. Now, one of the things that's uh, important is to take a, you know, you can take a look at housing and divide it up into new home sales and existing home sales. And you can see existing home sales have picked up over, over, this, over this recent time period from the lows of 2009-2010. Uh, but what's interesting is these home sales are really not that much of public participation. Uh, for example, Blackstone bought 40,000 homes. They paid cash. You have a lot of uh, private, you know, small groups of doctors, lawyers, dentists who pull the money to buy houses for speculative basis. You have a lot of foreign buyers, a lot of individual speculators but you don't have very many of the mom and pop people buying homes today. The numbers don't really seem to show it, but they're, they're not buying them because number one, credit is very tight and the down payment is very hard to come by. In fact, there's an interesting story about Ben Bernanke that he, he wrote or talked about. He couldn't get a mortgage. He left the Fed, had $800,000 mortgage. He wanted to refinance it. He went to the bank and they said, well, Mr. Bernanke, I'm sorry, you quit your job. You don't have a new job now. So your credit doesn't admit. And he said, well, wait. I make $250,000 of speech. Well, you know, we don't, that, that doesn't meet our models today. You know, eventually he got it, but it just shows how the pendulum swung when before you get something called a ninja loan, no income, no job, no verification, to Ben Bernanke, one of the most powerful men in the world who could walk into any bank anywhere and they would write a check for him for $10 million to be on their board immediately or more, and he had a problem, problem getting a mortgage. So we can see that it's, it's not really that much of, of a real market. And if you take a look at uh, ex existing home sales, you can see for the first time in 2014, they're down year over year. So they improved 2011, 2012, 2013. Now they're down under, for 2014. And a number of reasons. Number one, in 2014, only 10% of peak people with FICO scores of 660 or lower were able to get a loan. In the past, it was double that amount. I don't know who's familiar with FICO score, but FICO score is really sort of a credit rating for an individual. So scores go roughly from 550 to 800. 800 is triple A, you're probably all triple A here, and 550 is no credit. So 660 would be, you know, not at the bottom, but you know, you're sort of a working fellow. To give you an idea, on average, average FICO score in the United States is 700. So someone who's just a few points below that, only 10% of the people were able to get that. And in the United States, of course, if you can't get credit, you can't get a mortgage. And even though things have improved, the banks are very, very, very reluctant to lend out money. Now, there's an old adage that uh, banks will only lend money to people who don't need it. That was in the old days, then they changed, and now they're back to the old days, where they only lend people, uh, money to people who don't really need it. And you can see over here a very, very, very uh, interesting statistic that in the past, you know, only 10 to 20 percent of homes were purchased with cash. Now, I know. In some European countries, in some Middle Eastern countries, everyone buys it with cash. In the United States, everyone would get mortgages. But you can see recently, over half the transactions were all cash transactions. And what does that mean? Those all cash transactions were funds, wealthy speculators, foreign buyers, pools of capital. Very, very few people in the US have the wherewithal to walk in and buy a house for 200, 300, 400,000, even under $50,000 and just write a check and, and put up the money. So we can see that it's sort of an artificial situation. And what, what's happening is a lot of these people are cycling out of their home purchases. Home prices went up, they made some money, and now they're thinking about getting out. So that's going to cr create some sort of supply problem. And for sure, that 50% cash buyer is not going to really be there anymore. Now, if, if we take a look at, um, at the uh, mortgage purchase index, and this combines uh, uh, sales of new and existing homes, you can see there's not much of a recovery at all. You probably can't see the number, but it you know, shows the, the all-time low was February at uh, roughly 
159, and now we're 159.2. Once again, that's not very indicative of a strong number. So there's a lot of talk and thought out there that the housing market is so strong, and maybe that's because you're in Toronto, or maybe because I'm in Los Angeles, or New York, or parts of Miami. So it's a very bifurcated market. So in some markets, there's strong demand, homes sell for millions of dollars to very wealthy people, but if you go fly across the United States, there's large swaths of areas where homes aren't that affordable, people can't buy them, they can't get the credit, and that creates a very, very different outlook than you do. And one of the problems I think that people in my business have, because you're located in the major cities, in interact with people who have a lot of money, you think, well, things are really well, but when you talk to the man on the street, as Byron said, things are not as rosy as, as you would tend to believe. Now, one of the biggest uh, components, of course, of housing are interest rates, and it really matters. Uh, for, first of all, mortgage rates are deductible in the United States, they're not deductible in Canada, in most countries, and, and credit, when it's available, makes a big difference and rates, uh, rates are in the lows. So you can see that interest rates dropped from about five and a half pre-crisis to about three and a half. That's a huge drop. It creates a lot more affordability. It's the best of both worlds. You have the same house, but you just pay less for it. You don't have to downgrade. You don't have to go from a Mercedes to a Toyota to get the same thing. You just lower your cost of funding. But then we take a look over here when the Fed started in May 2013 with the temperature tantrum, then rates went up quickly, quickly about 125 basis points, and that really shut down the housing market fairly dramatically. And I'll show you an example later what the numbers look like to the average person. And since that time period, you know, rates have subsequently fallen down a bit, but are still are quite a bit higher. So that's one of the things to remember that the Fed and Janet Yellen are very cognizant of, that if they raise rates, that can hurt the housing market. There's a couple other reasons why the Fed can't really raise rates. First of all, the U.S. pays a half a trillion dollars a year in interest income. It's a lot. However, their average cost of funding is about 1% because what do they do? They borrow on the short end. Take a theoretical example. Let's say Fed funds went to 3%. Not that crazy a number. I mean, we've all seen in our lifetimes. That would mean the deficit funding for, for, the, for the interest would go from half a trillion to a trillion and a half. Where's the U.S. could get another trillion dollars to pay debt? So sort of a self-serving motive over here that the Fed sort of has a conflict of interest because if they raise rates, there's a real problem for the government to pay those rates. So I think rates are going to stay longer for, uh, lower for a longer time period. And then if the Fed does raise rates, it's highly likely we'll get into something called a flattened yield curve. I think it's very possible that the Fed would raise short-term rates. The long end of the yield curve, long-term investors would say, great, wonderful. You want to destroy the U.S. economy? You want to weaken it? That makes my 3% long bond look even that much better. I'm going to bid up the price of that. That makes my 2.5% tenure look even better. I'm going to wave them in. So there's a possibility that you could have a flattening of the yield curve. And if that happens, it might not be that bad for the mortgage market because the mortgage market tends to you know, trade off the, the longer end of the yield curve. Now, if you look at the refinancing, uh, refinancing is a very, very component, important component of the U.S. economy. And you can see over here, that uh, refinancing is on the lows. It's on the lows for a few reasons. Number one, most people don't have enough loan to value in the property. They don't have enough equity to get it. And credit standards are higher and rates are sort of low. But in the past, when rates dropped, that refinancing acted as a stimulus. Imagine you're an individual and you're paying $1,800 a month on your mortgage and you're able to refinance it and now you pay $1,500 a month. That's $300 in your pocket every month. That could be a car payment, more food in restaurants, savings, whatever. And it acted as stimulus, and it was a great form of stimulus because you didn't have to cut back. You got that money coming back to you. So now the problem is, is that uh, even though rates are low because credit considerations are so tight and because loan-to-value isn't really there, people aren't able to take advantage of it, and that's not giving the U.S. economy the type of stimulus that we had in the past. And to give you an idea, in 2002, 2003, when interest rates dropped to low, where Fed funds dropped to 1% and the long end got you know, 3 or 4%, at that point in time, maybe six or seven out of every 10 US homeowners refinanced. And they created hundreds, hundreds of billions of dollars that went into consumers' pockets 
to stimulate the economy. And now today, with interest rates much lower, Fed funds at zero, and, and uh, long-term rates, you know, sub 3%, it's only really 10 or 20% of the people are really able to, to take advantage of it. So if you, if you look at the housing starts over the last 10 years, you can see they've, 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 they've picked up. And one of the reasons why you know, they, they've been picking up slowly, there was just too much oversupply in the past. You know, you take a builder, any builder will build as long as they can build, as long as it's given money. The risk takers, they basically build till they go out of business. You meet very, very few builders who've been around for a long time period, but that's just the nature of the beast if you want to be a, a developer. And uh, there's also been a major change in demographics, which we'll talk about a little later on. Uh, in the past, I, I think to most people in this room, Housing is very important. To own a home is very important. Probably to most people in this room, to own a car is very important, especially a nice car. I think you're seeing a major change with the, change with the millennials that to them, housing is not that important. They just assume rent, their experience of their parents, the experience that they've seen personally. Housing hasn't been a very good investment, so they're afraid from it. They're, 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 they're afraid to step into housing, and they're much more likely to rent. I would say the same thing about autos. I, mean, I predict that in a few years that uh, There'll be self-driving cars, and millennials, for example, will look at a car. When I was growing up, a car was very important. Everyone wanted to have a Mustang, a convertible, some GTO, some nice car. I think younger people today, when I talk to them, they look at cars like an appliance, like a dishwasher. When I was growing up, I had no idea what type of dishwasher we had, if we had a dishwasher, what type of refrigerator, or what type of uh, washing machine. You just need it, you knew you had it. I think millennials are looking at it. So there's major demographic changes that are occurring that are gonna have a big impact and the housing market, and that's one of the reasons why I think the builders will, will come under some sort of problems. Now, what happened is that uh, due to sort of governmental policy, artificial government policy, home ownership went up too high, and you can see it reached a level of, oh, nearly 70%. Now, it was a government's policy that everyone should have a home, it's a good idea, but if you think about it more, for a lot of people, it's not really such a good idea. People don't realize when you buy a home, there's a lot of costs associated with it. You have taxes, you have improvements, you have repairs, things go wrong. Plus, when you have a home, you're sort of locked into that place. You know, unlike Canada, the United States is a huge place where you can get in your car and you can drive anywhere without anyone's permission and go anywhere, you know, drive 100 miles, 200 miles, 300 miles, and create a whole new life. And in the past, if you were renting and you lost your job and things weren't going well in your area, you could take your tools, take your trade, take your family, get in the station wagon, drive somewhere to where there's job opportunities. But if you have a house and that house is underwater, you're stuck there. You don't have a job, you don't have a house, you know, to be foreclosed on, so it made things very difficult. So the fact that everyone will own a house, you know, for the people in this room, it's a great idea. I'm sure you enjoy your houses very much, but if you're right at the margin, uh, you, can, you can lose that house pretty quickly. In fact, there's a statistics that most people in the United States, if they lost their job for six months, they'd be out in the streets. They'd have no place to live. So we're now getting back to the average, and I think that's a good thing, and I think it could go somewhat even lower. Oh, okay, there we are. Uh, so you can see another interesting thing over here. Housing is becoming less affordable. So the home ownership moving rate, 12 month moving average, is moving down, and the prices are moving up. So for a period of time, they're running together, and now there's this divergence, and a pretty big divergence, which once again shows that the cost of housing has moved up, but the amount of people owning houses is declining. Once again, something that's not very, very positive for, for the US housing market. And you can see on this, uh, on this uh, ubiquitous affordability chart, that affordability dropped a lot in 2013 directly because of rising interest rates. I can't emphasize how much interest rates are an important component to, uh, to, to, to pricing. And you can see in this housing affordability index over here that you know, poorer people are really between a rock and a hard place because housing is high. It's almost impossible for people to accumulate the down payment. Uh, I think the average savings for for most Americans, I'm talking about above the age of 40, something about $30,000 a year. So if someone wants to buy a house for $300,000, to accumulate after tax $30,000 for a down payment is very difficult for them. So what they do is they rent. And what's happened, of course, is rents today 
at least most parts of the U.S., at an all-time high because there wasn't that much of multifamily building. And people, because they don't have the down payment and they're sort of not that bullish, the housing market have rented. So you can see the red line are rents. It's good if you're a landlord. I'm sure a lot of people here are. But the bad news is income has dropped for these people. So they're between a rock and a hard place. So that, that, that uh, rental is taking up a bigger and bigger component of their disposable income. Now, here's an example, just the, the math of it, of the impact on, uh, on rising interest rates. So let's take a look at 2004. 2004, the rate was four and a half. People could get a certain type of loan. I won't go into it. The median price of a house was about 451,000. So their payment was about uh, $1,700. And to qualify for that, you needed about $70,000 a year of income. In 2006, there were a whole bunch of new loans that were sort of created that were not really very favorable to the individual, but when they took it, it was a low rate. So some people were paying $2,600, very few were, but some people could get loans for about uh, $949 for their house. So even though the house price went up to $569,000, in some cases, their payment dropped rather dramatically to $949. And that's one of the reasons why I pushed housing prices up. Because when someone's buying a house in the US, they're not really that concerned about what the price is. If they could only put down a small payment, down payment, they said it's $949 a month, the guy says, I can swing $549, $949 a month. It doesn't matter to me that much what the home price is. And then they had to pay the piper when those rates went higher and they lost their homes. Now, if we look at it today, today lending is, is much different. Almost all loans are, uh, are fixed rate, just a few, very few percentage are floating rate. The rate is four and a quarter. You can see even though the home price is down from 2004, the payment is up to 2142. So that's up about, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, 20, 20, 26 percent from 2004, 2006, or to put it another way, to qualify for that home today, you need an incremental $10,000 a year in income. And wages have not increased that much, maybe for the people in this room, but for most people they haven't, and that created the problem, so there's this affordability problem that because of tighter lending criteria, the fact that people have to take out 30-year mortgages, even though home prices are lower, they, uh, they, they, they can't, uh, can't afford it. We can see that, uh, once again, quickly, home prices you know, slumped after uh, mortgage rates rose. They hit a tipping point, sort of emphasizing the same point over, over and over again. But what's really more important over here is that uh, where are the first-time home buyers? And you see, first-time home buyers, these are the young people who are starting out. Uh, in the past, they were up to you know, 30 36%. Now they're dropping down to 20%. So fewer and fewer young people are able to go out and buy a house today. And one of the reasons for that is they can't, there's affordability issue, affordability issue, but also you have the household formation issue. Did you realize that household formation in the United States is at a 40-year low? And who goes out and buys houses? You know, people with families. If you don't have a family and there's a 40-year low, there's no real need to, to buy a house. You'll rent, you'll live with your parents, you'll live with your buddies, you'll, you'll, you'll do something else. And you can see, this tr shown in this other chart over here, that young adults living at home, probably some of you know it, is moving to all-time high rate. You know, it used to be in the 20s, now it's hitting the 30s. And they're living at home because they can't afford rent, and they can't afford a house payment. And of course, concurrent with that, you can see that home ownership is, for these young people, at the lowest in 30 years. So once again, that, that trend doesn't look that favorable. Uh, in this chart over here, there's a lot of numbers, but without taking into great detail, it says that home ownership has collapsed among the 24 to 34 year old individuals. And why is that important? That's the future. I mean, those are, those are the people who are going to determine what's going to happen in the United States, what's going to happen in the housing market, what their spending patterns are being. So it's something to be very, very concerned about. And what it shows is that, you know, that the 18 to 34 year olds without jobs is really peaked up, you know, in, in 2000 it was 24 percent, and now it's, you know, 10 percent higher, third higher, 34 percent. And of course, as you imagine with that, because you don't have a job, you live with your parents, you live with friends. So once again, that creates less demand for housing. So unless you really have a major improvement in the U.S. economy, you know, the housing market just doesn't look that attractive. And sort of to add insult to injury, st student debt now is at $1 trillion. It's greater 
than all the credit card debt in the United States. And unlike credit card debt, you can't discharge student loan debt through bankruptcy. They go after you, and at the end of the day, they'll take it out of your Social Security when you get older. It can't be discharged. So these people have this massive debt, no jobs, high home prices, and, um, and you know, very, very high rents. Finally, if you take a look at this scatter chart over here, it shows you know, the red areas are, are areas where home prices are, are you know, sort of under people's costs, under market. It's running about 20% right now. In big, many, many parts of the country, home prices would still have to go up 40% to get back to, to the, the original cost. So what's happening with these homes is a lot of them are becoming rentals. The, the, you know, the purple cylinder are single family homes that have gone into rental pools. So you can see that multifamily homes have not really grown that much or hasn't been that much building, but with, the, with firms like Blackstone and, and TCW and other, and Oak Tree have done, they've bought single family homes and converted them into, um, into sort of rentals. Eventually they're gonna to wanna to sell those, get out of those investments, and that will um, you know, create even more supplies coming to the market. So I have a little time left, and what I'd like to do is see if there's any questions that I could answer. I know I covered a lot of material real quickly. It's not going to be a test, but just wanted to give you sort of a theme of what we see here at Double Line.